he started his first video talking about how much he loved Stephen Moffat. He was a god writer. He was amazing, top tier, amazing, some of the best Doctor Who stuff. And when he gets called out for being obviously stupid and wrong in his first video, in order to pretzel not his mind, in order to still be right despite the writer who I idolized calling me out and saying how wrong I am, I now have to devalue Stephen Moffat's agency and talent as a creative in order to do it. He will literally pretzel not and do Olympic tier gymnastics rather than acknowledge that he was just wrong. I would think that a professional writer would know how to avoid being misquoted. This is like, unironically, the writer's equivalent of victim blaming. It's like, hmm, maybe somebody who writes for a living and is meant to be a wordsmith would maybe think about people like me deliberately misconstruing what he says for content, hmm? Did you not think of that? So I've spent this past weekend away. I was setting off on Friday morning to go to Edinburgh to see family. But then on Friday morning, as I'm packing, as I'm getting ready, I see people on Doctor Who Twitter freaking out because Stephen Moffat, who is normally pretty quiet on social media, he does interviews and stuff, and he has been involved with Doctor Who over lockdown. He, did, he contributed towards the Adventures in Lockdown book. He wrote those shorts for the Doctor Who lockdown, including giving a sequel to, you know, Nardol and Bill after the events of The Doctor Falls and World Enough in Time. However, he did take to social media to respond to, of all things, reactionary outrage bait. Now, on social media, on, on Twitter, the original post has been deleted. It wasn't actually posted by the person who made the video. It was posted by Dennis V. Willis, who I've, I've checked out uh, their profile. It's very, very interesting. Very, very uh, biblically themed. However, the actual original version here are screenshotted because I thought that this might happen. Doctor Who, does Stephen Moffat agree the show is trash? Uh, and Stephen Moffat responds on his actual Twitter, Oh, for I was pointing out that if I explicitly say I'm not writing for the new show, someone will turn that into me being negative about it, which you just did. For what it's worth, love David, love Shooty, love Russell, love the specials, all love from over here. And <laughs> it was so fun to see Stephen Moffat actually respond to reactionary outrage merchants and grifters in order to try and set the record straight. And I thought, why not just for fun? Let's see what he was actually responding to. The original video comes from a channel called Will of the Fans. Doctor Who, does Stephen Moffat agree the show is trash? And I figured, let's just go over this. I have not watched this video yet. Uh, like I said, I do not pre-watch these things because I think that the reactionary concerns conservative talking points are so easy to debunk that you don't even need to prep anything. So let's che let's check out what Stephen Moffat felt like. This is a take that's so bad, I actually do need to step in. Now this actually is Stephen Moffat's official Twitter account. He's not super active on it. However, he's been promoting his play on Friend. He was here for the Doctor Who watch-alongs. He started this for... Um, uh, for the Christmas Carol watch along as well. And he's been, you know, sharing stuff, you know, his, you know, coupling, unfriend, uh, interviews that he does as well with the Times, etc. So this is Stephen Moffat's official online social media account. And he decided to step in for this. Let's take a look at Will of the Fans. <laughs> After Randy Train's Defender, sorry, Russell T. Davis, first left Doctor Who after a successful five-year revival. One sorry, what, okay, <laughs> we're half a sentence in. Randy Train's Defender, what? After Randy Train's Defender, sorry, Russell T. Davis, first left... Rand... I don't even know what that is. Okay. Left Doctor Who after a successful five-year revival, one that only included an acceptable amount of deviant sexuality messaging, fans were delighted to hear that Stephen Moffat would be taking over. Mo oh, each sentence is worse than the last. What the... Like, so this is the initial 2005 revival with a bunch of sexual deviancy? Deviant sexuality messaging. Fans included an acceptable amount of deviant sexuality messaging. An acceptable amount. So I'm assuming the trans Cassandra, the pansexual Captain Jack, the definitely queer coded doctor who also fancied Captain Jack, etc, etc. Okay, apparently that's the acceptable amount in 2005, Doctor Who. Okay. Fans were delighted to hear that Stephen Moffat would be taking over. 
Moffat was, of course, at the time, a legendary figure already among Doctor Who fans, because I refuse to call myself a BS term like Whovian. Moffat, of course, had not only pinned Blink, the Doctor Dances, the Girl in the Fireplace, and other fan favourites, but he was even the guy responsible for the 1999 comic relief parody episode, The Curse of Fatal Death. That turns 25 next month. I need to do a video on that. Starring Rowan Atkinson, Richard E. Grant, Jonathan Price, Jim Broadbent, Hugh Grant, Julia Sawala, and Joanna Lumley, for crying out loud. Moffat would then take on the show for the hugely successful Matt Smith era before casting Peter Capaldi as objectively the last good doctor. I distinctly remember a lot of people complaining about Moffat as he wrote complicated interwoven arcs and concepts like River Song and The Impossible Girl. I never understood the complaints then, and I still don't now. Besides, no one had any idea just how bad it was going to become when Chris Chibnall came in as showrunner and decided to use the entire show to virtue signal about how big a feminist he is, with a feminist female doctor who insulted fans and the show, companions who no one cared about except for poor old Graham, poor Bradley Walsh, and of course, the Timeless Child, that plot that utterly devastated the entire law. He's reading this. Oh, no, that's fine. Like, he's, he can have a script off camera. That's absolutely fine. But, like, he's, he's getting angry at, like, the woke or feminist 13th Doctor Chris Chibnall era. But, like, does he have any idea what happened during the 12th Doctor and the 11th Doctor's era? You know, the, the proliferation of the super feminist, super pansexual River Song. You know, there was the idea of the Doctor's companion being even greater than the Doctor themselves with Clara, with the impossible girl. There was the, for credit, oh, there was the gender change, which was foreshadowed in the Doctor's wife with the Time Lords, and then actually canonized proper with Missy. There was all of that stuff. There was, of course, the heavily queer-coded romance between the Twelfth Doctor and Nardole. All of that stuff. I... Uh, to, to try and argue that Stephen Moffat's era is not, like, super progressive or super woke, even, like, in terms of, like, the liberal identity politics, like, almost kind of, like, shallow way in terms of, like, feminism being presented in Doctor Who, is just, like, a completely ahistorical reading. Or of the show by giving an incredibly sacrosanct... Insulted the fans. Oh, well, when it comes to, like, oh, we insulted... Like, when it comes to, like, Jodie Whittaker or Chris Chibnall insulted the fans, they do just lie about this. They, they just make that up origin story to the doctor that retconned william hartnell as the 12 and nardole were mates though like are you shipping yes they, they were mates in the same way that um uh, achilles was best friends well, with that other sure. soldier best friends all of them. in quotes best friends first after chibnall's doubling bill as well now here's the thing though the, the 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 conspiracy theory with bill is that because bill was in the last stephen moffat series uh it was the idea was that uh bill being a, a queer a queer black woman as the last companion before stephen moffat and peter capaldi left is like part of the weird like jewish conspiracy around uh you know stephen moffat was forced to implement all of these uh the, the, a black companion a queer companion and that's why they left that's the that's the cultural marxism uh analysis of the last series of doctor who which is when it started becoming super duper woke apparently and tripling down on this the show cratered ratings were in the toilet and rtd was called back to try to save the show only for him to acquire it for bad wolf it, it is dumb but it is still believed by many prominent commentators including but not limited to dave cullen secure funding from woke disney and then write in trans rubbish tenant being gay donna surviving her own memory revival <laughs> Tenant being gay, like, I, I even mentioned it earlier, it's the Tenth Doctor and Captain Jack flirting in Utopia. It's like, oh, this new regeneration, kind of cheeky. And Tenant's like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the queer coding of the Doctor has been there since Russell T. Davis took over in 2005, come on. The Celestial Toymaker being a pathetic racist and a bi-generation that resulted in the entire... The, the, the Celestial Toymaker being racist as a natural extension of what happened in the 1960s, crying out loud. The history of the show being destroyed as every Doctor who ever died now survives. Oh, also the new Doctor is a flamboyant gay black flouncer who dances in night... <laughs> I thought that was the end of the sentence. A flamboyant gay black? Like, it was one word. Gay black. Like, Nine and Jack kiss on the mouth in series. Yeah, that's true. Nine and Jack kiss on the mouth on the lips. But yeah, a flamboyant gay black, but like one word. Just one... <laughs> this is what happens when you, you don't get rid of your bad takes. A flamboyant gay black flouncer who dances in nightclubs in a kilt because it looks like a skirt. So it... And because he's a Scottish actor. So he's in a kilt. Because Shuji Gatwa has said in interviews that he has input on the outfits and the costume that he wears. And he wanted to wear a Scottish kilt 
because he's Scottish. The flamboyant gay black wanted to wear a Scot wanted to wear a Scottish kilt. God, why genuinely? Why are conservatives so fucking triggered about kilts? Je I all of the reviews that I looked at from Church of Ruby Road with like Shooter Gower, they were just losing their mind over the kilt. Like it's it's it's, it's a kilt. It's Scottish. It's like it's a gender neutral piece of clothing that had like dates back centuries like probably longer i i don't know much about scottish history obviously but come on it's a kilt why are you so triggered over clothing it seems that moffat was probably right to jump ship when he did and now people really wish he hadn't he himself ex basically just keeps extremely quiet about the fate of doctor who and whether or not he would ever return which he definitely would not <laughs> I mean, it seems that it's a pink gay coated kilt, though. Well, no, I one second. Church on Ruby Road kilt. I think you're misremembering here. One second. God's sake! Why can't I just find a picture? Why is there not just a picture of it? The scene with the with the police officer. It's that's red. That's not pink. And even if it is like pink, it's not the dominant color of the kilt. Oh Kilts are actually a more masculine clothing item, so that makes the outrage even funnier. Was it, yeah, it wasn't like, weren't dresses and, weren't corsets for men before they were given to women? I apologize if I've misremembered that, but also like trilbies and fedoras were women's hats when they were first brought around. Like all clothing is technically gender neutral, technically. Like if I were to like wear a kilt or a skirt or something, I wouldn't fucking burst into flames. Heels as well. Oh yeah, because members of the aristocracy were really like paranoid about how tall they were. So sometimes they would wear heels. Yes. Don't remember American here, but I thought kilts were made using certain colors depending on the clan. That is absolutely true. I don't know exactly what clan would be represented in Shooter Gatwa's colored kilt. So that, okay, so that's actually decent lighting there. That's like a dark green with a bit of like dark red to it. I don't know what clan that would be, obviously, but it's not, okay, it's not pink. That's what we were here for. It's not pink. Do you think 15 nicked one of Jamie's old kilt? Oh, that, that's my head cannon now. That's my head cannon. He was like, when was the last time I was like really gay? Uh, oh, it was when I fancied that Scotsman. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's put the kilt on. During production of Shakespeare plays, men sometimes wear women's clothing and vice versa. Well, traditional, authentic, in quotes, Shakespearean theatre productions, they didn't have women on stage. So it would be like men or young boys playing the female roles. Like that's traditional, authentic Shakespeare. It's why the idea that people talking about drag being some sort of like terrible criminal thing happening now, drag and like the, the connotations that come with it dates back centuries in the UK. Anyway, right. Based Moff is based. And has the let's go. Let's and go back. People, I've, I've kind of lost uh, track. Moffat was I, I've kind of lost track of what was happening because we, we went on the kilt on the kilt digression. Kilt because it looks like a skirt. So it seems that Moffat was probably right to jump ship when he did, and now people really wish he hadn't. He himself ex basically just keeps extremely quiet about the fate of Doctor Who and whether or not he would ever return, which he definitely would not. <laughs> okay. Firstly, he's not really kept that quiet about the fate of Doctor Who because he, like, attends premieres and does interviews. He was at the 60th anniversary concert. He did that interview, that three-way interview with Russ T. Davis, Chris Chibble, and Steve Moffat was part of that as well. He's done the lockdown adventures. He did the Doctor Who Watch Along commentaries. He's not, like, obviously he's been doing other things as well, and he's got a production company with his wife and such. So he's, he's been keeping busy in the industry, but he's not kept silent about Doctor Who. And also whether or not he's returned to the future of Doctor Who. I will not confirm or deny anything and the positive or the negative but i do actually know definitively if he is coming back or not i will not say if he is or if he isn't but i do know the actual answer and that is all i will say i what can i say i work in tv people talk and i know people i will not say if he is coming back or not but i do know i mean it seems that based moff is based and has the same opinion about all this rubbish that we have. Hello, welcome back to Will of the Fans. My name is Will. See what I did there? Hope you're having a lovely Oi, day. My name is Will. You can't besmirch that name. If you find at some point that you are enjoying what I'm <laughs> Blink doing... Blink once, yes. Blink twice, no. 
There we go. I'm going to flutter my eyelashes because I, I, I will not say any more other than I do know for certain. And in this video, then please. What a long introduction. Button. Yeah, that was like nearly three minutes. Blimey. And it helps other people to find it and maybe they'll like it too. Also, you can subscribe to the channel if you'd like to support me in the fight against all of this rubbish that's been slowly killing our entertainment for almost a decade at this point. Thank you very much. We're going over to... I can't believe it's become such... I think we know that means it's not necessarily... It might mean that we definitely know that he's not coming back. Common practice for me now. Screen rant. As we see this, it's fine without me. Former Doctor Who showrunner sets the record straight about re potential return. Former Doctor Who showrunner Stephen Moffat reveals whether there is any chance of him contributing to the series once more in the future. I don't know why he's gone for the screen rant version of this because the interview itself is on the Radio Times. It's part of the Radio Times cover party 2024 where the former showrunner revealed whether or not a potential return was on the horizon. Screen rant is not always the best source of news. Well, here's the thing that isn't screen rant kind of been accused recently of writing an awful lot of like AI generated articles. I, I don't know if obviously if that's true because it's kind of hurt, it's, it's kind of hard to confirm it. But I've just been seeing that being talked about like quite a lot. I don't think so. Anyway. Uh, former Doctor Who showrunner Stephen Moffat reveals his honest answer to the chances of him returning to the series. Moffat began his involvement in the franchise between the classic series' conclusion and its revival in 2005 and would join the production of Christopher Eccleston's season as a writer. Once showrunner Russell T. Davis exited, Moffat led Doctor Who from 2010 to 2017, overseeing Matt Smith's 11th Doctor... Oh, so, okay. No, it's it's the subscribe bell. I, I, it was a weird train bell for a second. I thought that the trigger train that bowl strike pilots had, had turned up. Tenure, its fiftieth anniversary, and Peter Capaldi's twelfth Doctor era. Now, Davis is back as showrunner and has seen the upcoming Doctor Who season fourteen, which looks like utter woke trash. We know this because we saw the specials and the Christmas special, which were really, really bad. I mean, it's not that the the writing was as bad as Chibnall's writing. I mean, RTD is at least a better writer than Chris Chibnall. It's the fact that he inserted so much deviant messaging and woke BS, Donna's son daughter and Tennant suddenly being gay and oh, it was awful. Like, like I said, the weird deviant stuff that he's talking about is stuff that Doctor Who has done before, including in Rusty Davis's previous run. So why was it acceptable in 2005, but it's not acceptable now? I know that this isn't the real center of, of the video itself. He's talking about this Stephen Moffat interview with the Radio Times. But it's, it, it, it kind of just goes, it, it just further adds credence to the idea that with so many people... It was really just like between Gamergate and Donald Trump's presidency between 2014 and 2016, where like a whole generation of like terminally online men just completely ignored all of the political undertones and sometimes the overtones of all of the media they had consumed before that point. And then it just becomes a case of everything after 2014 is woke and trash and everything before then is apolitical and there's nothing to be seen here. It really is just a, like if films like Terminator or Alien were to come out today, they would be decrypted cried as like woke garbage mark my fucking words i would i'd bet my life on that alternative reality honestly i don't know why people complain so much about stephen moffat when he was gotta get that misgendering in there oh yeah if you like honestly if you're approached by this person yasmin finney and you think oh that's donna's son that's intense cope intense cope genuinely delusional thoughts if you think, yeah, that's Donna's son, that's the male actor, Yasmin, like, it's cope. It's, it's sheer, sheer cope. Genuine lunacy. Even if she didn't pass, in quotes, doesn't matter anyway. But the fact that they're willing to stake their flag on, of all trans people, Yasmin Finney, delusional behaviour. Unhinged lunacy. Honestly, I don't know why people complain so much about Stephen Moffat when he was in charge. I remember me and my friend who first got me into Doctor Who sitting around and talking about how much people complained about Moffat, but we considered him a god. He was doing great work. His his overarching arcs would keep us just glued to our seats. We wanted to know, like, in, especially with season six. Search for the sexiest picture there. No, I just I searched for the most safest for work one. <laughs> Which a lot of um, she posts a lot of thirst stuff on Instagram. I had to be safe for work, relatively speaking. When it comes to Stephen Moffat, obviously, 
your mileage will vary and it's all subjective, of course. But I think that while the Chibnall era was a step down from the Stephen Moffat era broadly, and of course Moffat wrote way more episodes and had way more seasons than Chibnall did, the highs of the Chibnall era did not reach stories like Heaven Sent, Word Enough in Time, etc. But the lows of the Chibnall era did not even approach stories like Nightmare in Silver or Asylum of the Daleks and things like that. Uh, I think that Chibnall kind of stayed way more in the middle ground, whereas the Moffat era, genuinely, you didn't know if you were getting one of the best episodes Doctor Who has ever done, or genuinely one of the worst. There is no, ep there is no episode, in my opinion, of the Chibnall era that is as bad as Asylum of the Daleks. Obviously, that's my opinion, but that's just that's how I differentiate between the showrunners. What people think was too far, and I just disagree. It was just damn good sci-fi. Anyway, we all know what happened next. And uh, there is, of course, a quote from Moffat where he was still in charge of the show at the time and he advocated for all of the DEI rubbish that started to creep in while Capaldi was Doctor. But remember, of course, when you are the showrunner of a BBC show, you pretty much have no choice but to say all that crap. Like, we, oh, we need to represent more different colours and women and feminism and blah, 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 blah. Of course, you're going to have to say that. You work for the fucking BBC. They're communists. So I never bought that Moffat actually really believed in this. Sorry, I almost spit out my coffee. Sorry, the BB. Sorry, Nists. work for the fucking BBC. They're communists. So I'm assuming that we're dealing with the definition of communism when it's when government does stuff. I'm assuming. <laughs> okay, firstly, I don't recall there ever being an interview where Stephen Moffat was talking about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And even then, like, I'm assuming that he could be referring to the interview that Stephen Moffat did when he was talking about Thin Ice. And there was the idea that they were casting people of colour during the Frost Fairs in the 18th century. And he was like, oh, you basically have to tell a lie. We're trying to sell an idealised version of history. And, like, firstly, Doctor Who has portrayed people of colour in the past before as, like, background extras and such. Like, the Shakespeare Code does it as well. I'm not here to try and show the Shakespeare Code as a beacon of progress or whatever obviously not it's written by fucking gareth roberts but like you know when when martha jones is like um oh i'm not gonna get carted off as a slave and she's having that conversation with the doctor and he, he's like oh it's still not too different from your time and then in late 16th century london streets there are women of color who are walking around who are once again dealing with it wasn't woke in 2007 but it's woke in 2016 because that's where my frame of reference is I and mean, i'm i'm formally soup brained but when it comes to like the idea that, oh, Stephen Moffat says that we have to tell a lie to portray people of colour in the background of the London Frost Fairs. I don't like that interview because Stephen Moffat is incorrect. Like, you don't have to lie about that because there were people of colour in London. Like, obviously, there were, like, they were, like, only in their tens of thousands in terms of sheer numbers, but they were there. They did exist. Like, even at the absolute latest, we do know historically that there have been black people in the UK since the Roman Empire, since the early Roman period. And, of course, that's at the absolute latest. There's evidence that dates back even, even further. Black people have always been here. So it's the idea that we're absolutely furious at historically inaccurate race swapping in, like, Wild Blue Yonder with Isaac Newton, but we also, also hate hate true historical accuracy in stories like Thin Ice. It's basically they just don't want black people in media. That's just the, the, the beginning and end to it. That's just it. They just don't want them in media. And part of it is because they don't... Like, this is a massive tangent. We, 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 we might talk about this later. He might bring this up again. So I never bought that Moffat actually really believed in this stuff. And the fact that he stayed so quiet ever since he left has kind of quietly... Um, forced me to sort of it's galvanized basically don't watch tv well there was that guy who we reacted to 
ages ago when Shooter Get was announced as the Doctor, and he was that old guy, but he had like hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube, and he was like, I was watching ITV, and I took a notepad when the adverts came on to count how many brown and black people there were in the adverts. Well, there was a, the Heritage England advert, and there was a black family, and of course, black people don't have interest in like local history, so that was just forced. It was on. It was crazy, but so many people are just so soup brained that they are unable to watch media and if there's not white people in it it just fundamentally snaps something in their brains and they just can't focus on anything else we saw this with the church on ruby road when there was the guy who was just livid at the idea of there being an all-black foster family and by all black it means a black woman and her mother and that that was the the all-black foster family I, the, the, that, I think it was reaper who said that yeah it's it, it's unhinged shit it's, it's like it's bolstrek brain where you where it's like oh these nasty white background actors and it's like what the f <laughs> you, can, you just can't engage with media like outside of this this identity politics framework nice me i feel that i'm right about moffat so let's see if i am right or if there's you know any evidence that he thinks that it's fantastic now? Now the narrator comes in and says, we would later learn he was not right. And Stephen Moffat ends up calling him out. Anyway, though Davis is back, Moffat has firmly ruled himself out of a return. I think Lawrence Fox mentioned the Anne Boleyn black drama in his trial. <laughs> yeah, because he's, he's, he's racist as shit. ...to Doctor Who when speaking to Radio Times. The writer states that despite the speculation from certain quotes and social media posts, he has no plans to return. Check out Moffat's response below. Look at my ageing face. How can I fit in? And I know because I've seen the feedback that people think I'm being evasive on the subject. The truth is, if I say anything negative about Doctor Who, it goes everywhere, like boom, everywhere, right? Ah. So then... That would imply that you have some negative things to say about Doctor Who, Mr. Moffat. Would it not? It doesn't exactly... Be he, uh, my camera's partially obscuring him, but he looks so fucking smug over what such a, a soup-brained take. It doesn't... That would imply that you have some negative things to say about Doctor Who, Mr. Moffat. Would it not? And the fact that we know that this exact thing happened where Stephen Moffat is like, if I do say this, if I am being evasive on the, on the subject, everyone's going to talk about it. And then this exact thing happened and he's just has zero self-awareness that he's played right into it. Zero self-awareness. It's like a living Dunning-Kruger. It doesn't exactly bring joy to the world if I just say something negative about Doctor Who. The fact is, it's fine without me. <clears throat> well, that's an interesting quote. Now, I mean, not really. Like he says, like you know, I've seen the feedback that people think I'm being evasive on the subject as as to whether or not he's coming back. And the truth is, if I say anything negative about Doctor Who, it goes everywhere and boom everywhere. Like now, this is from a covers party. Who knows if Stephen Moffat is maybe had like he he might be a couple of drinks in. But the idea of this is that if I say I want to be back in Doctor Who, I think I can fix this. I think I can change this. I think I can do that. Even if it's like just like jokes between friends, or even if it's just it could even be like misconstrued, just like this guy literally did. Like it. It, it's it's like a perfect loop it's a perfect like feedback here these three tabs here is the circle of reactionary life and steve moffat absolutely perfectly predicted it here and he says no the show's fine without me i don't need to be a part of it it doesn't need fixing it's absolutely fine because the fact that he would need to come back implies that something might be wrong with it or there's something that only doctor who can give the show like this is a perfectly fine statement this is a perfectly fine quote Anybody who's watching this and is woke or is a leftist is going to almost certainly say, well, he says it's fine. It's fine. He's obviously big behind the show. He thinks it's great. It's bollocks. No. Now, the fact that both of our names are Will means that he has a direct link into my mind. That, that's how he's managed to predict that. Way does he think the show is OK? He said twice in this quote, if he says anything negative, then he's going to get shit. That is a firm implication that he does not think that the show is doing well, that he does not think that the show is being treated properly, and in fact has much negative stuff to say about the show. 
He just can't because of who he is. So they go on here with his first season of Doctor Who. Moffat's now, keeping in mind that Stephen Moffat has also in the exact same setting at the um, Radio Times cover party in 2024, uh, Stephen Moffat thinks that Shooty Gatwa is, quote, magnificent. I think Shooty is going to be an amazing doctor. He's going to be different. But I've already seen this. I think we all have in the giggle that he's got all the command and the presence of a classic doctor, plus a whole funky new thing that's going on. And that's what we need. Moffat continued, because, you know, the funky new thing is great, but what you've really got to have is, I'm the guy who gives the orders. And the thing I particularly like from the giggle is when he orders David Tennant out of the TARDIS. He says, beat it, kid. And that's great. He's going to be a magnificent doctor and 20 years from now people will be complaining that he's still not in the show so once again same setting same publication radio times cover party published by the radio times like Stephen moffat has been pretty outspoken that he really likes shooty gatwa and what russell t davis is doing for doctor who so this is once again a reactionary conservative trying to fit the square peg in the round hole set his goals for the series with a fairy tale-esque tone from the moment the 11th doctor crash landed into young amelia wait one of his more recent videos responds to a moffat tweet he implies the tweet comes from a bot in the title what he's he's done a follow-up doctor who was i debunked by stephen moffat quote in brackets bot does he really like woke i'm not convinced oh my god imagine getting dunked on so hard by the writer that you're talking about but decide you know what not only am I going to double down, I'm going to assume that he's being a bot. The m cope is off the charts. We're watching that after this. Pond's garden shared Moffat's take on the Time Lord shone through. As audiences saw well, the- Remember, the thing about this guy is that he is wrong on purpose. He is willfully wrong. Like, like most conservatives, he does have a humiliation kink. The, the idea that he is wrong and gets called out for being wrong does give him some genuine, like, devious, like, degeneracy, like, style thrill. So- Obviously, he probably enjoys this, but still, it, like, obviously, it is just, like, further evidence for everything I've been talking about on my own channel. Doctor as a legendary figure who effortlessly chased the monsters away and could help anyone feel at ease no matter what. Even when facing death, loss, and self-doubt during Capaldi's tenure, the Time Lord would also always come out of it as the same aspirational figure. With this reframing, Moffat also developed the character beyond where he began in Doctor Who's... See, this is what I'm on about with, like, Screen Rant being accused of AI writing their articles. Like, this is just, can you describe Stephen Moffat's run on Doctor Who? And this is what an AI would genuinely come up with. Like, and is he just gonna, like, read this, like, full thing from Screen Rant? This is, like, content theft. Rival, ...giving the character a chance to heal from his trauma. That's true. He was not anywhere near as focused on the negative side of being the Doctor as davis's doctors were during the events of the day of the doctor every incarnation of the time Look, he really is just going to read the full screen rant thing fair enough absolutely <laughs> oh yeah but he's going to say fair enough absolutely at the end of the paragraph while his era faced its own share of criticism moffat's doctor who contributions still stand out as some of the shows find me in the comments what the hell was so bad about moffat but anyway from the asylum of the daleks man in depth exploration of the character in heaven sent genius genius probably the finest hour of moffat the terrifying horrors of Blink, and even the self-aware... Why is he just reading out the article that tells us the history of Moffat? Because he doesn't have his own opinions. He just, he just has to read this in order to, to pad out the humor video. Humor of the Curse of Fatal Death. That is great. If you haven't seen the Curse of Fatal Death, it's on YouTube. It's easy to find. You can watch Doctor Who fan polls. Is that what you got? Screen rant. From a quote. If uh, How can I fit in? I've seen the feedback. The truth is, if I say anything negative... But What's he saying about screen rant? Like it, it goes into its own segment about how Stephen Moffat's Doctor Who redefined the character. That that's what that was. Like what? About Doctor Who, implying that you will have something negative to say about Doctor Who, and you have to shut up to avoid the crucifixion that you would get if you did say something fucking negative about Doctor Who. Hang on, didn't he say earlier he loved Joanna Lumley as the Doctor in the Curse of Fate of Death, i.e. a female Doctor? I know, it's 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 soup brain. There's 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 no actual ideology in that brain of his. It is just, it's basically, he'll just get angry or whatever he's told to get angry about. I'm sorry, but I don't buy this. I mean, it's pretty clear. If, if someone asks me how I feel about, I don't know, let's say vinegar. I can't stand vinegar, right? If somebody said to me, so, uh, so Will, how do you feel about vinegar? 
but I had previously been like the CEO of a vinegar company, I would say, well, you know, I mean, it's not really a really good idea, is it? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't say anything negative about it, um, because if I do, it just makes me look like a chump, you know? So I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Yes, if I completely misrepresent and completely change the, the actual quote that he's saying, of course it makes it sound pretty bad. <laughs> he's right. He's writing unironically. He's writing Stephen Moffat interview fan fiction, which is a really strange niche. But you know, if you want to set up your live journal and your Tumblr and write Stephen Moffat interview fan fiction, you do. You will go for it. You absolutely go for it. But anyway, right. What one reason? We'll, we'll, we'll look at the follow-up in a minute because, I, like I said, I had no idea he did a follow-up. I really wanted to talk about this tonight on this live stream because I think that this is something that Doctor Who creatives, or creatives generally, but this is a Doctor Who channel, that I think that this is something that creatives should be doing way more often now obviously i don't think that the writers for doctor who are creatives or people involved in the show or media that gets criticized should pick a bone with every single person who says a bad thing about it or at least any anyone who says a bad thing in a conservative or reactionary lens like in a grifter sense like your nerd rotics and your bowl strikes and your hill versus baby face and stuff like that but what you'd kind of need to understand is that whether or not you say anything or respond to the fake news or the fake outrage and things like that it, your silence will be perceived in like any sort of sense your silence like ironically Stephen Moffat not wanting to say anything about whether or not he is back at Doctor Who and saying that I'm not involved it's fine without me that was actually turned into reactionary grifting fake news from Will of the Fans here like once again he's completely like proven Stephen Moffat right here but the fact that a vacuum exists the fact that a gap does exist it was going to be filled. So if it's going, to, so rather than leave a gap to be filled with reactionary, conservative, outrage, fake news shit, you should actually just confront it. Now, not all of the time, not always. I think that you need to be selective and need to pick your battles here. But I think that people like Stephen Moffat out, should be way more invested in this culture war narrative. They should be way more willing to go to bat and defend people who are actually at the center of all of this stuff. Now, Stephen Moffat is friends with Russell T. Davis. He is friends with Chris Chibnall. I'm sure he's friends like with Peter Capaldi and other people he's worked with and stuff like that as well. Like when Russell T. Davis got the offer from the BBC, one of the first people he messaged about it was Stephen Moffat, apparently. That's what the interview says. So, the, 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 you know, the, they are in communication with each other. I'm sure that Stephen Moffat has probably read a couple of the scripts as well to maybe give one or two notes. Like I'm, I'm sure that it's that sort of like unofficial, friendly, helping out a creative capacity but the thing is is that Stephen Moffat is friends with Russell T Davis somebody who is at the center of a big culture war narrative that is actively harming people and trying to bring them down and sometimes in many cases physically hurt them Shuti Gatwa has had to hire 24 7 security because conservatives absolutely hate the idea of black people being on TV um, heel versus baby face is what like 300 400 thousand subscribers actively thinks that women being in TV is making men commit more crimes and thinks that Russ T. Davis is a groomer, is a pedophile, just because he's a gay man. And this is something that I think creatives need to be speaking up against. Not even just like generally helping a culture or like generally like helping to try and push back against this bullshit, but also just protecting their friends, protecting their colleagues, protecting people who work on the same show as them like the amount of vitriol and the amount of bullshit that was thrown at like the 13th doctor's era like like i said i i've said before i won't name them but i know actors who are hounded off social media just for being in doctor who under chris chibnall and jodie whittaker not for anything they did not their performance it's not even the quality of them so just being in the show and they were hounded off of social media and they haven't come back and apparently, as far as I'm aware, the BBC and the creatives didn't do anything to defend them, didn't do anything to back them up. They just let the hate fester. They just let it grow uncontested and unabated. And I think that is like a dereliction of responsibility. Now, obviously, you can't defend everybody against all of the online harassment, especially when they're a woman or a person of color or another minority, another marginalized group, for example. But I do think that some sort of solidarity, public solidarity, should be done here, on the regular. 
Uh, and th th that's kind of why it was pretty noteworthy that Stephen Moffat actually took time out of his busy schedule on his official social media profile to actually debunk a reactionary talking point here. And I think that's really, really cool. But I think that more creatives should be doing it way more often. Every so often you will get a Russell T. Davis drunk at an awards ceremony saying, you know, conservatives, you're voting for bastards, murderers, abusers, and liars. Like, cool. Can we have that maybe a little bit more regularly, please? Can we call a spade a spade maybe a little bit every so often? Especially because, Russell, your lead actor is in, like, constant threat of violence and abuse and harassment. Like, for crying out loud, even if it's not for the show, even if it's not for the culture, for your leading man, please. And like, like I say, not all of the time. Pick your battles. Decisive precision strikes. But I do think this is something that we need to contest more. And obviously, Stephen Moffat, I don't think he's like a super hardcore leftist, communist, socialist or whatever. I think he's a pretty liberal guy. Probably one of the worst liberals, a smug liberal. And also, he's not, like, super-duper progressive. Like, he works with ardent transphobes, uh, like, you know, like Francis Barber, for example, who is just, like, unhinged social media presence. Like, unhinged hatred, just complete psychotic behavior on her social media. But Steve Moffat still teamed up with her to work on his, his play, even though just having somebody like Francis Barber around means that it's, it's a pretty unsafe working environment because she's vehemently anti-LGBTQ+, and where are you going to find LGBTQ plus people? In the fucking theatre. You know, obviously, shit like that. But it's fr it is kind of frustrating that it's left to, you know, a minority of people to actually call a spade a spade when you have like action I, and, um, and the thing is is because there has been so much silence because there has been so little pushback from actual creatives involved it means that it's escalated to a point where you have actual mps on gb news like a channel that has talked about how black people shouldn't be on tv you know how all queer people are pedophiles and stuff like that like honestly if like the rope came tomorrow like, it would, like, Russell T. Davis would be one of the first people on the list. And I know that sounds grim, but this is, like, genuinely the environment that has been fostered by the lack of rebuttal, by the lack of a response. I think RTD is aware of this stuff. I'm sure he's aware, but maybe if every so often he was like, hey, this MP thinks that Shooty Gat was a pedophile. Fuck that guy. <laughs> you know, I think it would really, really, really help if more high-profile individuals were able to shine a spotlight on the worst things that conservatives are saying about the people involved in those creative fields to the point where it becomes impossible for them to deny it, where it becomes impossible for them to save face and they either have to commit to the bit and further just ostracize themselves and go further into their echo chambers, or it actually calls them out and then there's, real, there's like real repercussions about it, where they may be lose their platforms or lose their jobs for example when you are like a creative a lot of it is just making sure that the people who are working with you are just like safe you know you know i imagine dave Fallon will call out fandom menace reactionaries for example i'm actually not sure i've not followed like the star wars angle of angle for it i've not really followed it but yeah the, the the fact that so much silence has like the fact that so much of this is coming from one direction it kind of just proves that I, why I think it's needed. Because like you could say, oh, if we say something, it'll get misconstrued. It'll get misconstrued anyway. It's what they do. They are li they will If you don't say anything, they will literally just make up quotes and make up things that you've done and then do it anyway. Would you rather at least have some agency over the narrative that will be forced on you? Because obviously nobody wants to be part of this culture war. Well, the left, nobody on the left, nobody who's actually harmed and impacted by the culture war wants to be a part of it. But we are in one, whether we like it or not. And the right don't play by any rules. We need to be able to understand the game that's being played here so that we can actually win it. How do we know this is Moffat's real account? He used this for his, um, for this, the Christmas Carol watch alongs, and it was officially endorsed by uh, the Doc 2 lockdown account run by Emily Cook and such. I also think false allegations should be challenged in court. A person making false claims either proves it in court or law is indicted for defamation. Yeah, obviously, we can't do that all of the time. But I do. But obviously, so much of this is done in the court of public opinion anyway. Like, hundreds of thousands of queer people a day are called pedophiles. But only one high-profile trial has happened in recent memory with Lawrence Fox. 
like and he was found like guilty of libel of slandering that person because they were a drag queen like you know that happens all of the time but very very rarely does it actually go to court it's why i wanted to talk about this it was cool that stephen moffat did this and honestly i think we should be doing this way more often not just stephen moffat but people who are actually involved in doctor who actually involved in the show because i think that actually like i think that the creatives the actual people who make the show that these people are supposedly massive fans of might actually do a lot to de-radicalize people and shake them out of the echo chamber I genuinely think so. Like, me, I'm just a, a, a stupid-ass YouTuber who talks about Doctor Who online sometimes. But honestly, every fucking week, I get an email from somebody or emails from individuals who are like, I used to watch Nerdrotic. I used to watch Heal vs. Babyface. I used to watch Bolstrack. And then I saw your reaction videos, and I was like, I was shook out of it. I was shook out of the rabbit hole and of the propaganda, and I actually saw it for what it was. It was incitement. It was unhinged behavior. And like now I'm a much happier person because I'm out of that. I got an email the other week from... Very very emotional parents who thanked me for getting their teenage son out of the alt-right pipeline and that they were like oh we've got our son back now he's a happier person because he's not watching these channels anymore because he watched your videos and he saw it for what it was he saw it for a grift he saw it for a lie he saw the false information and he knows how to spot this stuff now because you've talked him through it and i get that all the time and i'm just fucking me i'm me a youtuber with like nearly forty thousand subscribers can you imagine what a Russell T. Davis or a Stephen Moffat could do if they used, like, a fraction of their influence to stick up for the people who are on the receiving end of the bullshit that's being thrown against them all the time? The problem is, is that you're basically asking people to put themselves in the line of fire when they've already had a life full of getting that kind of hate thrown at them. It's a tough ask. I know it's a tough ask. I'm not saying it's... I'm not saying that it's easy. And like I'm saying... I don't think they should do it all the time. They need to be very selective with when they do it, and it needs to be, like, a precision strike. But obviously they're already in the line of fire they're already there they're already in the line of fire do they just want to go quietly like you know do they want people with hundreds of thousands of subscribers and rabid almost like cult obsessed like fans who are genuinely committing acts of terrorism sometimes like the the fandom menace viewer who tried to assassinate nancy pelosi who watched like the fandom menace centered videos you know you know like you're already in the line of fire don't you want to like maybe do something about it while you're there? I don't know. Obviously, I am coming from a position of privilege, of course, because I am not somebody who is attacked and hounded and constantly like slandered about. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm lied about very. I am probably one of the most lied about people in the Doctor Who community, unironically. And even then, it's probably like a fraction of what of like what Rusty Davis and Shooter Gatwa and Jodie Whittaker get lied about, of course. Like, but. If I'm able to influence people and shake them out of it, and like my videos just sometimes appear in people's recommended feeds, and then they watch it, and then they end up like getting de-radicalized, or at least they start becoming a bit more cognizant of what's happening to them. Like that happens basically as like a fluke every week. But when you have somebody who's actually involved as a creative, damn, you know, Steve, I, you know, I think that the Chris Chibnall era is woke. I think the Rusty Davis era is really, really woke. Oh. I loved Stephen Moffat's era. What's he saying? Oh, Stephen Moffat thinks these folks are full of shit. And he's like actually backing up his points. And he's like, you know, he's making a really good defense here. You know, oh, maybe maybe I should start looking at this stuff a bit differently. You know, obviously it's not going to work all the time. But I do think that creatives being able to put their thumb on the scale, even if it's ever so slightly, could have a net good effect for fandoms, for online culture and just culture generally doesn't matter what you say to those channels they make money from their nativity that's that's the thing though and that's what i've said before i don't make my reactions and res response videos and these arguments and these rebuttals to shake the video maker out of this because they have the incentive to lie they, they know they're lying they, they know categorically that they are lying they're counting on you folks not knowing that they're lying though like like you know will of the fans obviously lying all of the time all of the time always constantly constantly lying and he knows it this is an active disinformation effort but his viewers they don't have those incentive structures they're just viewers there are incentive structures in a matter of speaking in terms of just here's the dopamine rush for the anger that i feel whenever i see a black person on screen but apart from that like it's a different incentive structure but like i'm not after the reactionaries i'm after their audience 
I want their audience to understand that they are being lied to. That they're all like nerdrotic viewers and Ryan Kimmel viewers and uh, heel versus babyface viewers are the back of that human centipede. That they are actively being lied to. That they are always on the regular being insulted. Like, what, what, like it's it's why I said like it's why I captioned the um, Church on Ruby Road reaction video, the Ryan Kimmel bit, like, <laughs> despises his fans. And I, I, I called the chapter something like that. Because I do think that you need to have some level of, like, disdain for your audience. That you will just lie to them all the time. Like, just constantly. Like, like, like I... I don't think that it shows that you think very much of your audience if you just lie to them every second of every day. All their channels look the same. Oh, and ironically, they are NPCs. They, 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 you know, they are sheep. They will follow the exact same talking points. Speaking of NPCs, is Stephen Moffat a bot? Doctor Who, was I debunked by Stephen Moffat bot? Does he really like woke? I'm not convinced. I need a haircut. Well, a couple of days ago, I made a video about how Stephen Moffat, the former Doctor Who showrunner, personal hero of mine, and to my knowledge, the least sullied of all the modern Who showrunners of... Wasn't Ryan Kinnell the guy who did that Batman review and complained about good black people? I think that might have been him, yeah. Uh, I, I don't really know much about Ryan Kinnell, but I do know, like, he was in that nerdrotic Blue Beetle video, and he was like, oh, Mexicans, they're so sneaky. And it's like, just obviously racist whom there have been only three, including Chibnall the Male Feminist and Ruin the Doctor, sorry, Russell T. Davis. So Moffat had come out and said that- I mean, Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat would probably describe themselves as male feminists as well. What? I don't even know how that's meant to be a dunk. He was not intending to return to Doctor Who in any capacity, and that anything negative- He did the lockdown stuff. He- he- he he, he co-wrote a book with rusty davis and chris chibnall during lockdown one second let's find this one second stephen moffat lockdown yeah the adventures in lockdown book for children in need chris chibnall paul cornell rusty davis neil gaiman mark gators pete mateague stephen moffat vinay patel and troy wilkinson yeah so, come on ba basic shit basic information come on that he might say would only <laughs> i was so totally wrong but now I hear how i move the goalposts spread everywhere immediately an astute observation of course that to me sounds like a person who has some negative stuff to say about the show but doesn't want to for fear of backlash or or selling out his compadres whatever maybe uh other members of the club if you know what i mean anyways or possibly he does actually like what's happening right now. I mean, you, you could Occam's razor this, or you could come up with this massive, like, harebrained conspiracy that it's some sort of weird club that he's unable to create. It's like, a, come on. So that's what I said in the video. And I thought that would probably be the end of it. But then I started getting comments on that video telling me that Moffat had replied and apparently debunked my video. Wow, that's quite an interesting development to think someone I discussed actually replied. Fantastic, and thanks for the free press to the guy that shared my video on X or Twix or whatever you want to call it in the first place. Remember, I mentioned this before with the, with the, the bowl strike review of Church and Ruby Road. You need to watch this guy through the framing that th this is like an actual humiliation kink thing. Like, like most conservatives, it's a humiliation kink. But remember, we're not aiming for him, we're aiming for his audience. Nice. But actually, I've only got more questions now as a result of this little exchange, and I'm going to bloody well talk about them today because this video directly involves little old me. Hello, welcome back to Will of the Fans. My name is Will. See what I did there. I hope you're having a lovely day. And I went and had a look on Twix, and um, yeah, sure enough, there was a uh, rebuttal, allegedly, from Stephen Moffat. Of course, if you know anything about Stephen Moffat, you'd also know that he left Twitter years ago um, because he kept getting a load of crap off people. Um, and he's actually very difficult to find on Twitter. Um, at least when there are 7,000 Stephen Moffat accounts on the platform. And you don't really know which... Oh, get to the point. ...one is which. So I began by Googling uh, Stephen Moffat's real Twitter. Which led me to SW Moff. Which uh, appears at least to be the... Uh, current account of Stephen Moffat. 
There is, however, another account, Stephen underscore Moffat, which joined in September 2012, only tweeted... Oh my god, get to the point! ...in one thing, and somehow got to 1,272 followers. Now, as I've said, there are a lot of Stephen Moffat... Oops. Uh, ...accounts that you can find uh, on Twix. And you can see here Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Sherlock the Game, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, <laughs> Stephen... We know it's his actual account. We've got to get on with it. Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Moffat's Time War, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat, Stephen Moffat. So, you know, I really have to go with what I'm being told here. Uh, 9.6 thousand followers, SW Moff, this account right here. It doesn't exactly give itself much credence at first. At first glance, you'd think this is another fake account. Stephen W Moff, at SW Moff. Jesus Christ, it, 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 it. we know he's reading from a script partially, which is fine, but did a fucking AI write the script? Like, the AI prompt is four minutes of, is this Stephen Moffat's Twitter account? Enter, and I'll read, come on, this is his actual account. 9,735 followers in this. Like, obviously, fair enough if he thinks that, like, at a first glance, is this the actual Stephen Moffat account? Let me check. But, it, like, if you do, like... 10 seconds of research you'll realize it's actually his account you don't need four minutes leading up to it crying out loud my good friend ryan roger athe there of snh alumnus so i guess yes this does appear to actually be the real steve moffat and uh very good so far so good so then what did he say what fucking hell we're nearly five minutes in say to me after i said that he had said Anything negative he has to say will only spread. And that that to me sounds like someone who has something negative to say and just doesn't want to. Well, or if he said anything that even alluded to the idea that he might have something negative to say, such as the idea that he should come back to Doctor Who because there's something he wants to do to it, it might get misconstrued. Mm. The response I got was this. Quote, oh, for... I was pointing out that if I explicitly say I'm not writing for the new show, someone will turn that into me being negative about it. Which you just did. For what it's worth, I love David, love Shooty, love Russell, love the specials, all love from over here. Fair enough. And I liked it. I mean, I'm quite happy to have uh, received this response. And, um, you know, if that is really you, Stephen Moffat, then thank you very much for trying to clarify However, wait. So, so he's just lying in the title then, like with the, with the bot thing. Like he he went into this knowing that it wasn't a bot, but he's just like, hmm, hmm. Conservatives lying about stuff. Oh, oh, what a shock! Stop the presses. I I kind of have to take issue with the response, because you see, I would think that a professional writer would know how to avoid being misquoted. Someone who works with words for a living would probably know the difference between saying that if you explicitly say you're not writing for the new show, someone will turn that into something bad. And what was actually quoted in the Radio Times uh, quote itself saying, uh, if I say anything negative about Doctor Who, it goes everywhere. Those are two very... This is like unironically, like <laughs> the writer's equivalent of victim blaming. It's like, hmm, well, maybe somebody who writes, maybe somebody who writes for a living and is meant to be a wordsmith would maybe think about people like me deliberately misconstruing what he says for content. Hmm? Did you not think of that? <laughs> it's sort of like, hmm, your house got burgled? Oh, but you've got the security system and you've got the lock? Well, you didn't fucking consider that I would dig under the house, that I would use my, <laughs> that I would use my Bugs Bunny tunnel. Hmm, you were just asking to be robbed. Come on. Three different statements. One is saying... Yeah, this is cope. Oh, absolute giga cope. ...that you presumably have something negative to say. If we're to presume you have something negative to say, 
and then you say that, then it's going to... Look at him waffling, trying to play, like, six-dimensional chess just because he doesn't want to accept that he was wrong about something. Remember, like I said, he knows he's lying, he knows he's wrong about everything ever. That's just his entire deal. That's the entire conservative reactionary deal, okay? He knows he's wrong, and, be and being wrong is part of the point. It's part of the whole thing. But he's not able to, like, actually acknowledge that he was wrong. He's not able to acknowledge that he might have said something incorrect, or he might have misread the situation so he has to double down like this like he's he, like he needs to present that he was actually so not wrong that he was like quadruple right and even Stephen moffat just doesn't know what he's talking about and Stephen moffat doesn't even know what he thinks bread like wildfire you write tv sometimes therefore you should be perfectly spoken on social media unironically and also remember this was at the radio times covers party it was a party that where they were drinking and it was like hey on the record uh, here's my dictaphone or whatever do you want to say something or well, steve moffat is like maybe three sherry's down or something like c come on the other is not that at all. That's just saying that if you explicitly say something completely different, that people will in inherently infer negativity from it. People would rather be right than happy. Honestly, if you play your cards right, you can be right and happy. That's not what I actually did. I took a quote that presumes, presupposes there is something negative to say and that you might have something negative to say about no, but, but it. But it's right there. It's the sentence before. It, it's right it's on the screen it's right above your cursor it, it's there and i know because i've seen that feedback that people think i'm being evasive about the subject it, it's there it it's it's literally on the screen you you can see it will will i know you can see it because you're fucking looking at the screen i know you can see it that's it that is the assumption that i was forced to base my entire video on and, you know, now, another angle on this that we should address is the fact that uh, people in my comments do like to regularly uh, remind Not me. relevant at all, but Moffat seems like he would be an IPA guy. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I, I think he'd, he'd be the type of guy who, like, is into craft brewery. Like, not, like, not a specific craft brewery, but he'd go into a bar and he would be like, what is the local? What is on tap? What, you know, I, I don't want to go for the branded drink. I want to try something new in every place. And that's, that's a drinking ethos that I can get behind. Me. That... Sorry, did I miss something? Sorry, I, I was reading chat and people are saying the word forced. Sorry, I think I might, I might have missed something there. Presupposes there is something negative to say and that you might have something negative to say about it. That is the assumption that I was forced to base my entire video on. F forced to base? No one made you do it. Did, so <laughs> did, did, did Russell T. Davis come in all seven feet of him with a gun to your head and make you do it? Come on, no one made you do it. No one forced you to do this. Come on. <laughs> Another angle on this that we should address is the fact that uh, people in my comments do like to regularly uh, remind me that the wokeness, the diversity shite, actually did begin <laughs> with... Turns out he's not looking at the script, he's staring down the barrel at every video. Yeah, so straight on is the camera, to his left is one of his monitors, and to the right is not the script, it's just Russell T. Davis holding a Dalek gun. <laughs> with the Moffat era, and... Um, you know, it was him that started changing um, history to include more black people and stuff like that. There is, of course, a uh, quote. Of all of the things that you could bring up about the Stephen Moffat era supposedly being woke. You know, not the super feminist Clara at the center of the universe overtones. Not the, you know, the clear 12 and Nardole shipping. Not the gender change between you know, the master and Missy, and also what happened with the Corsair and the doctor's wife. No, none of that stuff. Not, you know, River Song, Amy Pond, ardent feminist characters. No, not that. It's the inclusion of historically accurate black people. That's the line he draws. That's the first thing he brings up. Changing um, history to include more black people and stuff like that. There is, of course, a uh, quote that Moffat actually made quite a while ago now um it was on doctor who tv which i'm trying to find now to bring up for you guys and it says here this is a quote again ah, god damn it i mentioned this earlier this is why i don't like the interview because uh, attributed say, to stephen moffat. Say, moffat why did you say this 
<laughs> Unironically, I'm on the side of will of the fans here. Surely that somebody who's meant to be a wordsmith wouldn't say something so stupid. And we've kind of got to tell a lie. We'll go back into history and there will be black people where historically there wouldn't have been and we won't dwell on that. We'll say to hell with it, this is the imaginary better version of the world. By believing in it, we'll summon it forth. And outside of the fiction, it's about anyone feeling that they can be involved in this industry as an actor, a director and a writer. It's hugely important and it's not good. When we fail on that, we must do better. Okay, now the second half of that I agree with because so much of like popular culture and what are the like enduring franchises that are still going around in the 21st century like your superhero stories and your james bond and you know all of these franchises that were started in the mid 20th century were started during time you know when when like jim crow laws were still in effect when like segregation was still a thing you know superman is like over a hundred like how old is was, how old is superman first superman comic Action Comics number one came out. Okay, it's uh, not okay. It's nearly ninety. Action Comics came out in nineteen thirty-eight, so it's like it's nearly ninety years old. Superman. So like, like black people couldn't even vote or sit in the places where they wanted to on the bus when Superman came around. So of course, when Jim Crow law and like when the Jim Crow laws were taken away and civil rights was enacted and such. Obviously, things didn't change overnight. It wasn't like a, a single flick of a switch and all of a sudden there was equality. There was all of these centuries of, of like systemic issues that had to be contended with and a lot of that also includes proliferation in media. So that's why so much of like popular culture and because we are like a slave to franchises and and long running series and stuff why there is the push to gender swap or race swap and things like that now with reboots and revivals and that's because the quote unquote original versions like people of color weren't represented in that in those uh, in that fiction in the in that media originally which is why there's a concerted effort to try and rectify that why you will get some plays which will uh race swap a character like it's it's part of an act like it's why you can sometimes like have some like stories or like for, for example i was watching a clip the other day of guys and dolls uh I, I can't remember why i was watching a guys and dolls clip um i was watching a guys and dolls clip the other day and it was like a recent modern revival and there was a lot of like black gangsters on on, on the stage as well as like white gangsters as well but when the original film came out the mgm film with frank sinatra and marlon brando it was it was it was white city you know you know but but now like like it's more accurately represented in terms of the time period of new york and guys and dolls but also it's just more of like it's just something that you didn't see before but you see now because there's more parity in terms of representation like we are now just sort of catching up to actual demographics in reality on screen that's taken like a very very long time to get there it's and now that it's actually happening people like will of the fans are fucking livid about it but when it comes to this quote and we've got to tell a lie we'll go back into history and there'll be black people where historically there wouldn't have been and we won't dwell on that he's responding specifically to thin ice um with a series 10 story and thin ice takes place in the london frost fairs what century was that uh the frost fairs uh, is the it's the it's 1814 is the setting of the london frost fair so so if you just google black people london 1800s in the 18th century england there was a black population of around 15,000 people. They lived mostly in major port cities, London, Liverpool, and Bristol, but also in market towns, villages, and the country. So, like, they, they don't have to tell a lie for Thin Ice. They were there. Like, w one reason why conservatives get so bloody angry, like, about the idea of, like, representation in media, black people specifically, is because, and follow me here, genuinely, they don't view black people as human. They, they don't view them as people who have existed on this planet at the same time as white people. They, 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 they kind of view them as a demographic, as a, as a fucking mutation that just popped up in, like, when Martin Luther King Jr. came around or whatever. Or when slavery, when the ships came in to, like, drop off slaves and stuff. That's, that, that's when they were born. That's when they were introduced. Like, genuinely, they treat them like fucking X-Men. Like some weird mutation that's just recently popped around and now they, they're, they're just now asking for rights or whatever obviously it's it's ludicrous it's lunacy it's like an ahistorical reading but it's uh, that's why that they view it like that it's why when you get 
like horrible histories doing that rap for black history month about we've always been here like black people have always been in the uk they've always been a part of the population but for people like will of the fans and other reactionaries and conservatives they're like oh well you know with 18th century london frost fairs black people didn't come like they, they didn't exist then they've just been planted there like it, it's it's stupid which is why this quote from stephen moffat annoys me so much like we've got to tell a lie it's not a lie i like, fair enough if you want to tell an ideal an, an idealized version of history or whatever but in thin ice specifically which is what this story is about it's not a lie it's stupid it it's not a good quote it's it like ironically stephen moffat does actually lie when he's talking about telling a lie here i don't know maybe moffat's playing five-dimensional chess here or whatever but yeah it's it's yeah it, it it's a it's frustrating Okay, maybe I take it all back. Maybe Stephen Moffat shouldn't be responding to reactionaries because they'll say shit like this. Okay, as woke as it gets there, really. Yes, basically just saying, we're going to change history. We're going to put black people where there weren't black people, much like they recently did or RTD recently did with Isaac Newton being an Indian looking dude. <clears throat> changing gravity to mavity and all that rubbish that really has no business being in it. But this is supposed to be a pseudo-intellectual show, right? And thus, we should be as factually accurate as we can be in order for the fiction to seem legitimate. Firstly, that's stupid. Marco Polo did not travel with his caravan with the TARDIS and the First Doctor. William Shakespeare did not fight witches. Isaac Newton did not invent the theory of mavity. Agatha Christie did not fight a giant wasp. The Crimean War was not fought by fucking Sontarans, etc, etc. But once again, it's just the idea. I, I, and I'm very glad that Will of the Fans is just being pretty explicit with this. He absolutely hates the idea of an ahistorical Doctor Who story when it comes to race. You know, you can't have black people when it comes to, like, in settings and environments when they shouldn't exist. Okay? But then he also complains about characters like Bill. He also complains about the shooty Gatwa and Yasmin Finney. Like, so they just don't want black people on screen it's so it's so apparent it's so obvious they don't want them in historically inaccurate settings they don't want them in historically accurate settings and they don't want them as fictional characters in and of themselves they just <laughs> this is it <laughs> they just, they just, it's so simple they just hate black people this is a, one of the central conceits of wokeism in the first place, but there is a difference here between what Mr. Moffat says and what usually gets said. Because usually if I call out the fact that a character has been race swapped, I'm going to get called a racist straight out of the gate. The producers of the show come out, they insult the fans. They This is obviously a lie, but I obviously you can point out that, for example, Isaac Newton is meant to be a white... There's no harm in pointing it out, and nobody takes issue with you pointing it out and be like, oh, it's the actor from It's a Sin, or it's the Asian actor from It's a Sin. You're only racist if it becomes your defining personality trait to get angry about it online. Obviously, that's not the only barometer for racism, but it's what we're dealing with here. If I, you know, the, the idea that you're getting so bent out of shape over a jokey prequel where Isaac Newton discovers the theory of mavity that's where the racism comes in pointing out that something is a race swap is not inherently racist pointing out that something is a gender swap is not inherently sexist for example you know like the observation in and of itself is fine it's what you do with the observation it's what you imply with the observation that's where any potential bigotry and problematic elements can come in they defend it or alternatively they absolutely ignore it and act as if there's nothing strange whatsoever about the race swap that there's nothing worth noticing and that if you notice it you're the racist <clears throat> as opposed to the people who change someone's color because it matters apparently which i would argue is the real racism but but, but, but who said that though who said yeah, you're on about the isaac newton example i'm pretty sure that's pretty apparent but like who said this you're just making shit up now once again lying deliberately you're making this shit up no one has said this like, I don't, I genuinely don't think a single creative involved in Wild Blue Yonder has publicly commented on the race swap of Isaac Newton. Like, let me know in the comments or in the chat or whatever if I'm wrong, but genuinely, I don't think anybody officially involved in the production, from RTD to the actor himself who played Isaac Newton, Nathaniel Curtis, I don't think anyone has actually mentioned this or pointed it out, like, or, or made a big comment about it right but once again you need to sort of like project an enemy here you need to invent you need to construct an enemy here to get angry at but moffat here says something kind of different he says and we've got to tell a lie the first thing he says there is a not even a tacit 
a total acknowledgement of the fact that going back in history and inserting black people where historically there wouldn't have been is telling a lie. God, I hate this quote so much. This is one of the many reasons why I've never really believed that Mr. Moffat actually does buy into all of this wokeness, especially because as it became more and more egregious, he and Capaldi left the show. This has always been something that has required clarification from Mr. Holy Moffat. shit, I mentioned this earlier. The idea that, like, uh, oh no, it, uh, apparently the idea here is that Stephen Moffat did not want to cast someone like Pearl Mackey and was maybe forced to by the BBC. Maybe he was, like, forced to include, like, black characters in Thin Ice or Empress of, of Mars and stuff. Like, but, uh, this, this is where the fucking conspiracy shit comes in. Where it's like the like this, unironically, this guy is like only a couple of steps removed from the Jewish question, like Dave Cullen. The idea that oh, it was actually some secret cabal of Jewish people who influenced Stephen Moffat from the BBC in order to include more woke elements. Unironically, that that's where that's like the the genesis of this idea that like Dave Cullen landed on later on. Moffat, and again, something he has not ever clarified for any of us. So then, it's pretty depressing. Like, th this guy's thought process. The idea that Stephen Moffat was apparently only forced to write a, uh, a, a, a character like Bill, bring in a p terrific actor like Pearl Mackey, tell a pretty effective and powerful LGBTQ plus story about literal conversion therapy with the Cybermen, but apparently he didn't actually want to do it. Like, I've, I've mentioned this before. It's the idea that it... When, when, chat, when did I mention this? The idea of removing agency from the creatives involved. When did I mention this? I mentioned this in a previous response or reaction video, maybe a couple of months back. The idea that Stephen Moffat actually has no agency or has no creative or has no creative input as a writer in order for this narrative to work that Stephen Moffat was forced to write a Cyberman Bill conversion therapy story that he was forced to put non-white actors in the story that he was forced to maybe change the gender of the master for Missy that he was forced to make Clara or Amy and River Song super feminist or whatever it, it, it just removes the idea that Stephen Moffat is a creative with his own agency with his own ethos and his own thought processes it genuinely it sort of like belittles and diminishes Stephen Moffat that input as a writer but he needs to do that in order for this narrative to stick like he mentioned in the last video that he and his group of friends consider Stephen Moffat to be like a god when it comes to writing I think that was the word he used like it was like a god but it seems to have like so little regard for Stephen Moffat as a creative in order for this narrative to stick that he was forced to do this by the BBC and that Stephen Moffat didn't have any pull or clout even though he delivered like a massively successful run of Doctor Who and Sherlock at the same time as well. Like surely the BBC would probably just leave him alone to do whatever he wanted. Was it one of your bullshit reaction videos where you said it? It might have been. Honestly, the conservative like thought process is so like garbled and so like homogenous. Like there's very little deviation. It is like essentially cultish groupthink that they do kind of blend together. And for any of us. So then here's the uh, tweet again, pointing out that he's saying something here which is not actually what he really said, as I have obviously- As far as I'm aware, the only thing Stephen Moffat was forced- to, well, I don't even think he was forced to do it, was write the Christmas special twice upon a time, because he was worried about them losing the Christmas day slot. As far as I'm aware, that's kind of the only thing that's been forced. ...proven now. So, of course, we have my response, which I was well within my rights to give. He's deflecting what uh, Stephen Moffat said specifically against his own video to this dubious quote react rhetorical trick. Oh yeah, remember he's tr like he's he started his first video talking about how much he loved Stephen Moffat. He was a god writer. He was amazing, top tier, amazing, some of the best Doctor Who stuff. And when he gets called out for being obviously stupid and wrong in his first video, in order to pretzel not his mind into still not being wrong in order to still be right, despite the writer who I idolized calling me out and saying how wrong I am, I now have to devalue Stephen Moffat's agency and talent as a creative in order to do it. He will literally pretz or not and do Olympic tier gymnastics rather than acknowledge that he was just fucking wrong. I said, uh, and I quote, I'd like to know why you specifically said if I say anything negative, because it sounds like you have something negative to say. Many of us feel that there is a lot wrong with Doctor Who since you left. Would you care to comment? So here's the thing, though. There's a difference between, oh, we have some criticisms of Doctor Who in terms of structure, writing, acting, stuff like that. Whereas Will of the Fans is just like, 
too many blacks. That's going to get clipped. <laughs> I, like, that's all he's kind of said, apart from, like, a, like you know, trans people and stuff. But that, that's, that's all he's got. So far, absolutely no response. And, of course, I woke up today after this all happened last night, and I wondered, you know, am I going to get any more from this? Am I suddenly going to be... That's totally getting clipped. It absolutely is. Damn it. I'm infamous because of this. I'm, you know, thousands... You'd think that a live streamer, Hootuber, would be better at his words. <laughs> Me and Stephen Muffat have way more in common than I thought. The people following him and commenting on my... Um, well, not thousands of people, but a couple of people leaving kind of snarky comments on my previous video about it. And I wondered, you know, fantastic. Am I now in touch with Stephen Moffat? And if I am, I would very much like to invite him to appear on this channel or on Saturday Night Hypnosis. I'd just like to get a little bit more background on what the hell is going on with this show. But I'm sure he won't do that. And, I, and more power to him. He doesn't have to. I have nothing negative to say. And I feel nothing negative towards Mr. Moffat. I'm still a great... I mean, you do think that he was, like, coerced by some weird communist Jewish cabal at the BBC or whatever you, whatever you want to say. That he was forced to include black people in his series. So you clearly don't think that much of him. Fan of his. And I still think his writing was the best that we saw in New Who. However, I found that there was no further interaction on this whatsoever, and the reason for that, the post was deleted by the author. Honestly, uh, we, we've, we, don't, we don't need to like cover anything there. I think we've uh, basically talked about everything that we wanted to there. They're all too scared to just say slurs. Sometimes they will just say slurs, but, uh, you know, they need the plausible deniability, but they also need to keep on escalating. Uh, and we're at the point where they are escalating to such an extent that there is no plausible deniability anymore. Like, you know, when you've got Nerdrotic just, like, calling Shooter Gat with a cheap, diverse doctor. Like, use critical thinking. What do you think he means by that? Like, obviously. He's ob he, he obviously just loads, like, loads black people in TV. Like, it's, it's pretty fucking unambiguous at this point.